to CLC. It's time to lift up the name of the Most High in this house. Can y'all help us lift him up today? It's a good day to bless the Lord. Your presence, Lord, is life to me. It's water to my soul. Your spirit, Lord, will always be breath to these dry bones. Oh, That's all I'll ever need. You'll sing it over me. You'll sing it over me. That's all I'll ever need. That's all I'll ever need. Yeah. Your goodness, God, it follows me.
now as our prayer partners make their way down to the front and up into the balcony there's a lot of people in this place right now a lot of people watching us online and there are a lot of needs if you need healing in your body maybe just healing in your mind healing in your spirit right now come down and let us pray with you believe God for healing to be made known and to be manifest in your life today because the healer is here right now he is in this place Right now, if you just need a word from the Lord or some direction for your life, if you're looking for an answer, the answer is in this place right now. Come down and let us pray with you. Believe God for that answer to be made known as we continue on our worship right now. Let's just worship Him. The miracle workers here, amen.
I got good news for somebody in the house today. Listen, I don't know what you walked in here carrying. I don't know the things that weigh on your mind, the things that have been keeping you up at night. You know what I'm talking about, those things. The one that we're worshiping right now, the one that we're singing about is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let me tell you what that means for you. The one that we're worshiping is the, the God that can take anxiety and replace it with peace. The one that you're worshiping right now is the same God that can unstop deaf ears in the Bible and perform a miracle in your world today. He's the same Savior that can walk up to somebody with no breath in their body and bring them back to life, which tells me, I don't know what you have dead in your life that need to be resurrected, but he can resurrect some things in your world today because he's the God of miracles. And so if you don't leave here with anything else today, you can walk out of here knowing that the one that you're worshiping holds your life and your situation in his hands. And he desires and he's able to meet the needs of his children. That's you and that's me. Come on, is anybody glad to be in church today? Wow. Feels good to be in church on Super Bowl Sunday. Hey, before you're seated, why don't you turn around, fist bump, elbow, high five. Tell somebody how happy you are to be with them in church today. Happy morning to you. Come on, happy morning. A super happy morning to you. Anybody nervous because you got some money on somebody this afternoon? <laughs> May God heal your nerves. Put your money on Jesus. He wins every time. What a joy to see all of you. It's an honor on this great, great day. We, every Sunday here is a happy Sunday. We enjoy the benefits, the blessings of the Lord, and we love to praise Him. And we get a little excited sometimes. We clap our hands and we smile. We smile because we believe that Jesus has been good to us. Amen. And what a joy to see you today and uh, all your jerseys. Forrest Gump's in the house today. One of our staff pastors wore Forrest Gump's 44 at Alabama. And this is not a college day today. This is a pro day, so Forrest didn't get the memo, okay? <laughs> and we got Bobby Boucher in the house today. He's here. <laughs> and then we got some Pittsburgh Steelers here today. <laughs> Have a hard time with that because they beat us in the Super Bowl a couple of times back in the 70s, and we did get one back on them a little bit later. But, boy, I tell you what, they were bad back in the day. And I couldn't stand Terry Bradshaw, and one day I'm going to have him come speak for us. That's how much my life has changed. <laughs> if you're a guest today, we welcome you, we honor you, we thank you for being here. What a joy to have you in the house today. And I promise I won't be lengthy. I hope I'm decent today and good in your life. Uh, we're going we're to speak today on Dreamers Incorporated. And Wednesday night, we're doing a series called Solomon's Secrets. And uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about grazing in your own pasture. <laughs> in other words, running your own lane. And it's going, to be a, it's going to be a great study. You want to be here and be a part of that. That's Wednesday night at 730. We have a house full on Wednesday night. So come, come early, find you a place to seat and hear the word of the Lord. Today, I'm speaking on this subject. Don't stop dreaming. Turn to your neighbor and say, he means that. Now, on the porch, I represented Emmett Smith, but today I felt like if you were a, a 49er fan or an Eagle fan or something, you wouldn't listen to Emmett Smith's jersey talking to you. So I take it off to preach as Pastor Rex. We're honored to have you. You may be seated. God bless. I love to preach about dreaming because I, I love to dream. Great men of the Bible were dreamers, great leaders of corporations are dreamers. Great pastors in this whole world are dreamers. And I pastor people who are dreamers. 
young people, middle-aged people, older people. Dreamers have this thing that I call the it. They see the world through different lenses. They have a certain step, a vision gate, a stride of going somewhere. Speaking to the vision slash dream of an individual or church seems to make the person or the place resonate with Christ who means the anointed one, his anointed presence and performance. See, vision edifies. Vision equips. It enables us to see clearly. Jesus has a plan for his church, and whether you want to admit it or not, you're a part of that church. You're a part of it. And Jesus spoke these words to his disciples one night around a campfire in Caesarea Philippi. He said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I say that with no emotion, but that's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. I'm going to build a church, and hell can't stop it. It's the unstoppable offense against what hell thinks and is an impenetrable defense. God's church is here to stay. It's not going away. It's not sick. It's not weak. It's not inert. It will not go down. It will not be defeated. It's destined to fly both now and then because Jesus built the church. But the shelf life of dreams are short. They really are. Dreams can die. One songwriter gave a remedy one day when they said, keep the dream alive and don't let it die. If something deep inside keeps inspiring you to try, don't stop. And never, never give up. Don't ever give up on you. Never give up on you. See, for dreams to live, they must be kept alive. And God's Word agrees with that. For in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible said, Old men shall dream dreams. Now, I'm not old, but there's a lot of people older. <laughs> and the reason that that's in the Bible is because that God understands that young men automatically dream. Dream of the girl, or the girl dreams of the guy. Or they dream of an education, or they dream of a certain job. But the Bible says that old men will dream dreams. In other words, God wants dreams to continue in your life. He don't want you just to be a young person dreaming. He wants you to be an older person and still dreaming. Now, I, I admit I have a problem. I, I enjoy Victor Hugo's writings. You read one of his great writings and you can feel this man's heart. Victor Hugo, the French romanticist, wrote nearly the entire 19th century. He wrote classics like Autumn Leaves and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And yeah, my favorite, Les Miserables. And Les Mis was one of the longest running musicals on Broadway, 6,680 shows, performances. It finally said goodbye. Then they made a movie out of it with Hugh Jackman. It was made that went to the top in movie watching. And the play slash movie, like the book, asked the simple question, and here it is. When life gets rough and when dreams die, does God really care? Does God care? The character who best asked that question in Hugo's work is a little girl named Fantine. She's a young mother that has fallen on hard times with a baby born out of wedlock. And Fantine is forced to hide the baby in the factory where she works and risk losing her job if the baby is found. For those perhaps in that predicament, there's a fine line, folks, between getting by and going under. See, her secret is finally discovered and her life devolves downward. And she winds up on her deathbed. And the mayor of the town, a former convict, Jean Valjean, comes and, and turns benefactor and visits her and promises to look after her daughter. But before Fantine's passing, she sang of the bitterness she found in life and how nothing turned out as she had dreamed it would be. The song said, I dreamed a dream in time gone by when hope was high and life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving then I was young and unafraid, and dreams were made and used and wasted. And there was no ransom to be paid, no song unsung, no wine untasted. Then she said, but the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder as they tear your hope apart, as they turn your dream to shame. I had a dream my life would be so different than this hell I'm living, so different now from what I, it seems, so life has killed the dream I dreamed. And like Fantine, each of us possesses such a dream. You call it a vision, call it a desire, a sense of destiny. 
You called it a lark, a wish, a hope, whatever. Friday night, Patty and I got to be grandparents to three of our wonderful grandkids. We have eight. And three of them we got to keep the other night. Brad and Cass had a night out, had to go to an event. And so we were there with a nine-year-old boy who plays Fort, Fortnite. And he, we didn't have to worry about him. He was good. <laughs> but we have a six-year-old granddaughter and a four-year-old granddaughter, and they wanted to be American Idol stars. And so Patty and I and the one that wasn't singing at the present time got to be the judges. And they both came through American Idol seven times trying to make it to Hollywood. Because, because they have dreams. See, a dream is an, as needful to our existence as the air that we breathe. Let me say it again. A dream is as needful to our existence as the air that we breathe. And I'm going to give you three pivotal things that I want to share with you today and hope that it will help you. Only a dream, folks, makes life livable. Only a dream. Great men in the Bible were dreamers. Abraham dreamed. Jacob, his grandson, dreamed of angels ascending and descending from earth to heaven. His son, Joseph, Jacob's son, Joseph, dreamed. He put it in his son. Dad, Mom, if your son is going to inherit something from you, let it be a dream and visionary spirit. Let them understand that there is anything as possible in their life. Let them understand that God can do anything through them. And one with God is a majority over anything that wants to stop you in this world. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and Daniel interpreted that dream and then he forgot his dream and it cost him his life for a space of seven years. See, life becomes impossible, folks, without a dream. Paul said in Romans 8, we're saved by hope. Hope saves us. A dream rescues us. There's some kind of nurturing power in a dream. To dream is the human capacity to believe things can be different than the way they are. It's to believe that I don't have to stay in this rut. I don't have to stay in this situation. I don't have to stay in this predicament for the rest of my life. I can walk out of this rut. I can get out of this situation. I can make something better of myself. That's what a dream does. A dream must come in your life. See what faith is. In the daytime, a dream is to the night. To have no dream is to be lifeless. It's a candle blown out by the evening breeze. It's a spark extinguished in a person's eye. It's a curtain drawn over a human soul. Many of you remember the character, Miss Havisham, in, in Dickens' Great Expectations. She was an eccentric elderly lady who lived in seclusion. And years before, Miss Havisham had been deserted at the altar on her wedding day. And if that's happened to you, please forgive me. I'm not picking on you. She lived only to gain revenge against men in general and one man in particular. Her life stopped the day she was to be married. Oh, she was still alive, but her dream had died. She continued to wear her wedding dress for the rest of her life. And the hands on every one of her clocks in her house halted on the hour she was to have been married. Dickens put his finger on the fragile truth found within the hearts of humans. He said, without a dream, life becomes impossible. You must have a dream. Only a dream makes life doable and makes life livable. There's a character in Acts chapter 9 named Saul of Tarsus who had letters in his pocket. He was on his way to Damascus to kill some Christians. And heaven had revealed that his dream of zealous orthodoxy was only an illusion. And everything he had lived for had been shattered when God knocked him off of his beast and put him flat on the ground on that road. While lying blinded in a house in downtown Damascus, Paul must have felt that life had taken his only dream. And it was then that he heard the opening of a door, followed by the shuffle of sandaled feet approaching his bed. Was it friend or was it a foe? Was it somebody to help me or somebody to hurt me? That's what I want to know. But the first words out of the man's mouth who walked over him named Ananias was brother Saul. How do you think this made a miserable man feel? Somebody cares when my dream dies. Can I share with you right now that there's a pastor preaching in this pulpit today that's been here for 30 long years, very short years for me. But I declare to you, every time you walk in this door, I want you to walk out of here knowing that there's a God with you, that there's a God beside you, that there's a God in you, that God is able to give you dreams. He's able to give you dreams. And it may be Groundhog Day today, but I'm going to say it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. God loves people who dream. 
Keep dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Hmm. Ananias told how God had spoken to him and told him that Paul was a chosen vessel that would bear his name before the Gentiles. And when Saul's sight recovered, the dream remained. The godly dream remained. The dream made his life worth living. He wrote 14 books of the New Testament. He made at least three missionary journeys. That dream caused him to seek and apprehend the one who had apprehended him. So what is your dream? To see wrongs righted? What is your dream? To see justice done or mercy shown? What is your dream? To see the fallen on their feet again? What do you dream about? What is your dream? Your, your reply should be quick, for a dream is a thing that makes life livable. You shouldn't have to fumble around like you're trying to find your house shoes that you had worn in a year. You should be able to grab your dream and say, this is my dream, because dreams not only make life livable, but life tries to kill dreams. Life tries to kill dreams, and life will if you let it. Even nominal Christians are familiar with Romans 8, 28. Most could at least quote the essence of it. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Yet reading in the same chapter, Paul tries to describe the various elements of life which attempt to rob us of the love that God has for us. In fact, I never have counted them before, but there's 10 things that Paul lists. It's double digits. It's 10 things that he lists that tries to separate you. He said, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Throw the kitchen sink against me. Throw it all against me. There's nothing. Oh, somebody help me right now. There's nothing going to separate me from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, my Lord, nothing, 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 nothing. You know, here's the beauty of what I'm preaching today, that everything that we live in in this life is temporal, but the thing that lives in us is eternal. Everything that is around us is temporal. Everything in us is eternal. And I refuse to let any temporal thing Stop the eternal dream that has been locked in my soul. That has been locked in my soul. And I'm on my way to heaven. And I got to get past the temporal stuff that's trying to stop me. I'm walking. I'm on my way because there's something eternally pulling me to another world. And I will not let that dream die. Come on. Life is still doable. Life is still doable. Let's go forward in the name of the Lord. These things will not succeed. Paul admits that all these things will try to peel us away from the dreams that we have in Christ Jesus. Life tries to kill dreams. One man said, I walked beside the evening sea and dreamed a dream that could not be. The waves that plunged along the shore said only dreamer, dream no more. Dreamer, dream no more. That's what life would like to do. Life would like to kill dreams your dreams. I am not trying to seek any kind of sympathy today. I'm really not, but this month, 39 years ago, I lost my dream. When I lost half my family in a tragedy. And I said, I said, I don't need to be doing this anymore. If this, is, if this is what you get for preaching the gospel, I don't need to do this anymore. But I had a visit from the restorer of dreams. He came and talked to me. And he said, you will preach with greater gusto and greater power and greater understanding than ever before. And I stand here today 39 years later saying, he's still the keeper of dreams. He's still the reigniter of dreams. He still can make your dreams come true. Come on now. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Perhaps my calling in life leads me to the shadow side of life more than I would like. 
Discouragement and faces I see every week. Disillusionment discourages people and pierces my heart. The phone will ring. It's over, Pastor. My marriage is over. My children have walked out on me. They don't want to be, uh, us to be their parents anymore. We've had a divorce with our kids. Our widow, our widower is saying, why am I yet alive? And he or she is gone. The unasked question on people's faces, if God cares, then where is he? And the best one is why is that person blessed while doing wrong? And I struggle while I'm doing right. David asked that question a long time ago. David said, my foot almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But he said, I went to church. I went to the house of the Lord and I discovered their end and I discovered my end and I like my end better than their end. David admitted it, it, it was a dream saver. He saw their end and realized, and he didn't let his dream die. Living in the Southwest here, you may have seen dream catchers. I'll show you a picture of one. They're instruments made of hoops of wood over which are woven intricate patterns of thread. The American Indians attach these to the papooses of their children. That's a unique name. I still love that word, papooses. Bad dreams were supposed to become entangled in the threads and the good dreams are supposed to get through so your kids will have good dreams and not bad dreams. 2020, folks, is simply this. Our need is not for dream catchers. Our need is for dream sustainers. God has dropped in your heart. Oh, I want to preach now. He has dropped in your heart that you are somebody and that you do matter and that your life will make a difference and that you will move the needle in life and that it will happen in your life. I'm here to tell you, don't let the dream die. Don't let the dream die. Don't let life kill your dream. Let it live, let it live, let it live. It isn't hard to dream, it's hard to keep the dream alive. Now let me, let me give you three ways to keep the dream alive. You gotta avoid isolation. You gotta avoid it. Isolation is a dream killer. Dreams might be born in solitude, but they are kept alive by being in the right company. David might have been anointed at his father Jesse's house, but his dream of being king was found by avoiding the murderous Saul and being in company of encouragers. You know, David had 37 mighty men in his life. He had 37 mighty men, men, 37 of them, that said, I will stand up for you. I'll break through the host of the Philistines over here and get you some water. I'll go fight those people in a bean field for you. I'll pick up a jaw and I will fight till the world looks level for you, David. I believe in people that can come into our life that can help our dreams stay alive. Don't isolate yourself. Put yourself with winners. Let yourself be surrounded by people who believe in you, who believe in your God, who believe that there's a future for you and come to the house of God and be fed every Sunday in the fact that God still loves you and he is for you. Wow. The second thing is you got to commit the dream to writing. You got to write it down. A pen is mightier than the sword, the Bible, uh, the, the, the word says. And when a dream is written down, its chances of surviving increases greatly. Everyone dreams, yet only the 4% many times of people who write down their dreams usually see them accomplished. That's why I preach stuff and say that's refrigerator material. Put it on your refrigerator. Write it down and look at it and read it every day. Read it every day. Read it every day. Hallelujah. Emmanuel, God is with us. Read it every day. Habakkuk was told in 2, 1 and 2, to write the vision, make it plain on, ta on tables, that it may, he may run that reads it. And Job said, if I had a table of stone and I had an iron pen, I would engrave God's word on that stone and I'd throw it over my shoulder and I'd let everybody in the world see that my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. It may look like that I am losing it all, but my Redeemer lives. It may look like that I'm going under, but I'm not. I'm going over. My Redeemer lives. Somebody needs to write your dream down and look at it every day and dream it and dream it and redream it because you can't let your dream die. Avoid isolation. Commit it to writing. And then number three, you've got to live the dream. Everybody say, live it, live it, live it. You know, when I marry couples, it's fun to marry people. I love weddings. I've done about 650 of them, and I can't wait till the next one. I love weddings because it's a joyous time. Hallelujah. It may not be after that, but it's a good day that day. 
I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I didn't mean to say that. But I tell, I tell young people getting married, I, I give them three words that I think are, are marriage makers. The first word is a word called value. Value. How do you value each other? It's not, oh, she's gorgeous. Oh, God, she's gorgeous. That don't work. About a year down the road, that gorgeous loses gorgeous. <laughs> but value. How do you value your wife? How do you value your husband? How do you value your kids? Because how you value them is how you're going to treat them. And I've often said you'll never see a Mona Lisa on sale in a 7-Eleven because she has too much value and she's not even pretty. But the man that painted her put value in that portrait. Value. When you, when you buy a new car, you value it. You get it washed, I hope. When you get a house, you keep it up. You make it appreciate, not depreciate. You value it. Value your family. Value your God relationship. Value it. Talk to your God every day. Talk to your mate and talk to your children all the time. Value who they are in your life. The second word, the second word is a word called love. And you know it's a verb, it's not a noun. Love is not a wall. Okay, you're on this side of the wall of love, then I love you. You're on that side, forget you. <laughs> love is a verb. It requires action. You've got to show love. And since this is Groundhog Day, why don't you tell your wife about 15 times today, I love you, baby. Hallelujah, you're a good one. <laughs> Why don't you tell your husband, wow, husband, you're a wonderful husband today. You're a wonderful husband today. What are you doing? Repeat, 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 repeat. It's Groundhog Day. <laughs> you need to have love in your life and love in your home. And I know I'm outside the lines of reason because I'm a little goofy right now, but you need to have love in your house for one another. And the third one is a word that I call live. You got to live. You just got to live. You got to live life. Yes. How you doing? Oh, I'm pretty good. I guess so. <laughs> I think I might make it today. <laughs> Lift up your head. Look up to your Creator and say, I'm so glad you made me. I'm so glad you put a dream in me. I'm so glad you put hope in my heart. And I'm gonna make you shine on this earth, Jesus, because you're my Lord, you are my Lord. Everybody say, live. live. Number three, and I close. God is able to revive dreams. It isn't unusual for young men to dream dreams, young women to dream dreams. Young men and dreams are virtual synonyms. A young man sees a pretty girl and he says, Ooh, I could marry that. A young girl sees a guy and she says, I need to play hard to get, but I hope he comes over today. <laughs> but in our text, God promises that dreams would come to the elderly. Old men and dreams are almost anonyms. When an old man dreams, it's an anomaly. Now, you're older than me. You understand that? When the elderly dream, it must be a God moment. It has to be a God moment. God does this by working his spirit. In Ephesians 3, the message version said, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole New Testament. God can do anything. You know, God can do anything. Far more than you could ever imagine our guests, our request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently working within us. Isn't that tough? Raise your hand and say, God, you can do anything. Now put your hand down. You know what that means? He can revive your dream. He can revive your dream. You may have lost your dream. I've counseled some people this last week that's lost their dream, but I'm preaching to you right now. You can find your dream again. I found mine. He gives dreams. He renews dreams. He restores visions. Victor Hugo asked the question, how do I know God cares? The answer is that God still revives dreams. What, a, what he authors, he finishes. Now let me, let me close with this. Peter in Acts chapter 2 verse 17 spoke the words of the prophet, old men will dream dreams. The prophet Joel 
Joel spoke those words in his second chapter also. He said, in the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And God's going to restore. He's going to restore the years. Watch this now. That the locust hath eaten. That the canker worm has eaten. That the palmer worm has eaten. That the caterpillar has eaten. He's going to restore those years. Folks, I got to researching. I found this, and I want to share it with you. Just a little scientific research. I read what locusts eat. They eat plants. I read what canker worms eat. They eat leaves. I read what palmer worms eat, they eat foliage. And I read what caterpillars eat, they eat seeds and flowers. Not one, stay with me now, not one of those little creatures is a root eater. See, hell tries to destroy externally what has come up. But there's something in the ground that none of those little creatures mentioned can ever get to. In fact, there's a scripture I want to read to you right out of the Bible today. Job chapter 14, verse 7 said, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Verse 8, Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. I'm here to declare, what God drops in you, hell can't take out of you. God has placed a dream in your life. He's placed hope in your life. And there's a root system that these little bugs can't get to. You need to rejoice in the fact that when I get in the presence of God, my dream comes back alive. My hope comes back alive. And I feel nourished by the presence of God. Clap your hands real big because that's the Word. That's not me. That's God's Word. Randy, please help me. Please help me. Woo. I'm kind of like my old pastor back home. He was an Arab man and he could preach like nobody's business and when he wasn't getting enough hand claps, he'd say, go ahead and preach, son. Go ahead and preach. He's dead and gone, but he was a great mentor. He said, if you're not going to help me, I'm going to help myself. Yeah. Frederick Nolan fled from his enemies during a time of persecution in North Africa. And one night he fell exhausted into a wayside cave. He had given up. He expected to look up and see the faces of his enemies leering over him. He resigned to facing death with dignity. And so Nolan sat at the back of the shallow cave waiting his pursuers. And as he watched the opening of the cave, a spider fell across the cave opening and began to spin a web. And within minutes, that little tiny arach arachnid had woven a beautiful silky network across the en entire entrance of the cave. And not long after, Nolan's pursuers arrived and, stopped, arrived and stopped at the opening of the cave. And although footprints disappeared into the cave, the men thought it impossible for Nolan to enter the cave without breaking the spider's web. So they left the cave and Frederick Nolan escaped. Later, he wrote these words in his journal. I love these. They're a part of what I live on. Where God is, a spider's web is like a wall. Where God is not, the wall is but a spider's web. God is into weaving dreams in a person's life. Let his spirit confirm to your weary mind God cares because he revives dreams. That's how you know he cares. And some of you will walk out of this place today with new hopes and new ambitions and new desires from an old dream. Because God shows how much he cares because he revives that in your life. And you've been revived today. First service today, I have about two minutes. I must let you go. But first service today, a young man who used to come very regularly to our church came up to me after first church and he was weeping and crying. And he said, Pastor, he said, I thought my dream was over. But he said, God revived it today. He said, I thought I was done. He said, I, I've done some things that are not good, Pastor. But God revived my dream today. 
And I said, well, I see you. He said, you'll see me. I'm ready to take God into my life again. In the story of the great racehorse of the 30s, Sea Biscuit, there's a sequence in which the great horse is scheduled to run against a larger, more powerful horse, which is thought to be unbeatable. That horse's name, War Admiral. And as the race progresses, the Sea Biscuit's rider has been told to hold the great horse, Sea Biscuit, back and allow War Admiral, the big horse, to come alongside. And the rider was also told Sea Biscuit must be challenged, must be challenged in order for him to do his best. And as the big horse comes alongside Sea Biscuit, as the trainer told the rider it would be, the jockey did something that he had never done before. He gave Sea Biscuit his full reign gave him words of encouragement and when he saw his horse jump out in front of the big horse war admiral with a smile and a wave he tells the jockey on the big horse so long Charlie see you at the finish mm. the Bible said we all run the race but only one wins you know what that means that doesn't mean we run against each other that means you run against your potential you run against what you should have been, what you could have been, what God wanted to make out of your life. And one's going to win, either you or the potential. Why don't you just step forward and say, I'm going to take everything God has for me. And I'll see you, Pastor, at the finish line. We're going to, we're going to revive our dreams in our house. Stand to your feet all over the building. I love you very much. Something has got to make this church kick at this time. Seeing the finish line, seeing hope, seeing redemption for so many, seeing a revival of joy, seeing a victory in Jesus, seeing healings by the masses, seeing God's church at the apex in this last day, seeing this brand new building being built, and we'll be able to have 6,000 people in it, 6,500 in three options and three services. That's a joy to me, folks. That's a joy to me. And I'm so happy that you're here today, and I'm sorry that we're crowded, but I'm really not sorry that we're crowded. I'm so happy you're in the house of God. I want you to clap your hands and say, God, I'm going to have my dreams revived. They're going to be revived, revived. 2020 is a season to kickstart our dreams again, so say long, say bye-bye to yesterday, and hello to the future. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me bless you in the name of the Lord. Father, I love you today. God, I don't want to stop dreaming. I don't ever want to stop dreaming. I want to believe, God, that when I'm 85 years old and you send me out to search for Moby Dick, I'll take tartar sauce with me because I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to trust in you until the day you call me home. Bless this congregation. Give us faith to believe the impossible and hope to receive the improbable. And let us know without a shadow of a doubt that you're walking with us and you're taking us someplace that this world is not going. We're going to be with you. Now bless this audience. Bring us back on Wednesday night for another lesson in Solomon's Secrets. And let us enjoy our life groups, God. Thank you for our mind starting on Tuesday, Lord. I love to have men at lunch with me on Tuesday. Thank you for that, Lord. And thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon CLC all these years. But God, we're pushing forward. We're looking for greater things and higher heights and deeper depths in you. In Christ's name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Everybody say amen. amen. I love you. You're one minute late getting dismissed. I love you.